Good afternoon and welcome everyone uh, to this webinar organized by the Middle East and North Africa program at the Swedish Institute of International Affairs. My name is Ruzbe Parsi and I'm head of the program and I will be moderating the conversation that we're going to have today. And the topic is, as you should know, uh, the international law ramifications and dimensions of the Israel-Palestine conflict. Uh, and we have an excellent panel to to help us navigate and understand what exactly the connection is between international law and the ongoing conflict. Um, but before we get to that, obviously you are more than welcome as attendees to ask questions. Please pose them through the Zoom function for that and we will try and bring up some of the questions as we go along, at least at half time and then towards the end of our webinar. We have roughly an hour and a half uh, at our disposal to try and, and become wiser on this very thorny issue. This seminar is the first of three. The second one will deal specifically with dynamics and developments within Israeli society, and the third one with a similar perspective but on Palestinian society. So in a sense what we're trying to do is both to understand how they are connected and how the conflict connects them, but in the two uh, seminars that follow on this one, we are also trying to understand the societies on their own, so to speak, because obviously there is more to both Palestinian society and Israeli society than just the conflict. But the topic for today is the law and what the law says about this conflict and how occupation and other aspects of it can, should, and is being administered. Um, and in order to do that, we have an excellent pattern, as I mentioned. Um, I will take them in, in alphabetic order and start with Dr. Valentina Azarova, who is a law international law practitioner and researcher with more than 15 years of, of experience advising international and government and non-governmental organizations. She's currently a research fellow at the Manchester International Law Center, University of Manchester Law School. Welcome. Uh, we also have Kat Dr. Katrin Catriona Drew, who is a lecturer in international law at the School of Law and Center of International Studies and Diplomacy at School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London. She's the co-founder and co-director of the Center for Study of Colonialism, Empire and International Law at SOAS. Welcome. Then Dr. Ralph Wild, Associate Professor at Faculty of Law at Faculty of Laws at University College London. He's an expert in public international law, including international human rights law, and also has an interest in the interface between international law and related disciplines, including international relations and history. Welcome. And last but not least, Professor Paul Vranje, uh, who is a professor of public international law at Stockholm University and director of the Stockholm Center for International Law and Justice, and a member of the Swedish government's advisory Committee on International Law and a member of the Permanent Court of Arbitration. Welcome. I am very happy to have all of you with us and I hope that the audience will enjoy this conversation as much as I am sure I will. And in order to start us off, I'm going to ask Paul to give us a background to the legal history of the conflict and how it has developed. Paul, please. Well, thank you, Rosby. Well, the conflict between Palestine and Israel is full of law, and in particular full of international law. But I will make—I would like to make three points uh, based on a very, very brief historical expose, and they are all relevant for the occupation, the situation now, but most of all for the final status issues, and and perhaps in particular for the two-state alternative. And those issues are territory the status of Jerusalem and the right of return. So I will start with territory and for that purpose, I will show you a map. Um, so uh, the mandate of Palestine was formed in 1922. And this is the map of historic Palestine by the League of Nations out of territory from the former Ottoman Empire and administration was entrusted to Great Britain. The mandate did not contain any details on the future disposition of the territory, but in 
November 1947, the General Assembly of the United Nations adopted a petition plan, the famous resolution 181, in which it allotted about equal parts of the territory to the, to the Jewish and the Arab groups. And that is the second map. Immediately thereafter, armed violence broke out between Arabs and Jews, and the Jewish side was better organized and expanded control of territory far beyond the plan, first in the civil war with the Palestinian Arabs, and then in the ensuing international war with Arab states. The, Ar the armistice in 1949 between Israel and the Arab states resulted in what is now commonly called the borders of 1967, because they remained until 1967, also referred to as the Green Line. And that is the third map. At this time, there was no formal international recognition of the expanded Israeli territory beyond the borders of 1947. As uh, probably all of the uh, audience knows, in 1967, Israel occupied the remaining parts of the old mandate. So Israel now controls all of the historic Palestine. During the Oslo peace process, the Palestinians accepted the 1967 or 1949 borders as the basis for a future Palestinian state. And these borders also gradually became generally recognized as the legal borders of Israel. To complement that, the UN has also uh, almost unanimously adopted numerous resolutions which recognize the right to self-determination of the Palestinians and their right to form their own state. So from an international law point of view, the upshot is clear. It is very difficult to claim that the Palestinian side should compromise further in territorial terms beyond the 1967 borders. So this means that the Trump so-called peace plan from early this year cannot be grounded in international law. So I will now turn to the second issue, Jerusalem. In the partition resolution, Jerusalem was supposed to be a corpus separatum, a separate body from the Palestinian and Arab states. The reason for that was the shared interest in Jerusalem, not only from the two sides, but also from the international community, in particular from the three monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And that view is still upheld, at least in theory, by a large majority of the state which is why, with the exception of the US and a few others, almost no other states has an embassy in Jerusalem, east or west. So while the strongest legitimate interests in Jerusalem, of course, are held by the two parties, the international community at large has a legitimate and recognized interest in, in particular in securing universal access to the holy places. So the third issue, while the territory and Jerusalem are difficult enough. The most difficult issue is surely the question of return of Palestinians to Israel. During the war in 1947 to 49, around 700,000 Palestinians fled Israel, both before and after the initiation of the international war with the Arab states. The, mass, the vast majority of these people were either expelled or fled from justified fears of atrocities, in particular after the massacre at the Day of Yassin. This, the issue of re right of return is quite complex, but let me just say the following. The Palestinians who fled or were expelled have been deprived of their human right to return to their country. And they have also been deprived of their, their human right to nationality, which Israel should have granted them since Israel was or has succeeded the mandate, the League of Nations mandate. Of course, this applies literally only to those few who are still alive. In relation to their descendants, the situation is less clear. But at any rate, these people have inherited the right to compensation for property taken from them as a minimum. So with the important exception of Jordan, the Arab countries to which many refugees fled have not allowed them to integrate. That is, of course, very deplorable, but it does not change the basic legal assessment. Further, obviously a return of millions of refugees and their families would have considerable consequences for the social, economic, and political makeup of Israel. However, that does not change this legal conclusion. 
So to summarize from an international law point of view, three basic, basic facts. So regarding territory, it is not justified to claim that the 1967 borders should be a basis for further compromise on the part of the Palestinians. Second, in Jerusalem, the international community has a legitimate and recognized interest as well, in addition to the two parties. And thirdly, the right of return remains for Palestinians who fled. Thank you. Microphone. Sorry, let me just let me just ask you a quick question before I turn to Valentina on Jerusalem. So am I correct in understanding that the way Jerusalem has been considered from the legal perspective, it's a separate issue because of this uh, access notion? Well, um, I should say that in political terms, that interest has not been uh, persistently upheld, if I put it that way. But when I, uh, I worked at the Ministry for Foreign Affairs, I was involved in discussions with other EU countries, for instance, and other interested parties, you know, in, in order to um, think about how to um, ensure that, in particular, access to the holy places uh, would be secured for all those involved. Thank you. Valentina. Could you tell us something about the, the basic legal foundations then, the law of occupation? How does that play out in this particular case? Right, thank you very much uh, also for the invitation and um, uh, make uh, very uh, brief remarks on the question of legal foundations as I understand it um, in terms of the currently applicable laws, both to the protracted asymmetric conflict uh, between Israel and Palestine and to the long-standing legal claims to territory uh, return and so on as discussed by Paul. Um, I'd like to make two, two sets of, of uh, uh, brief remarks. Uh, first on, on the scope of the applicable international law beyond international humanitarian and human rights law. Um, and the specific rules of, of those uh, specialized bodies of law commonly understood to apply to situations of occupation. And second, on the relevance and significance of framing certain uh, types of occupations as unlawful situations as a matter, as a matter of uh, the international law on state responsibility. And in particular, the responsibilities of third parties, states, uh, international organizations, uh, as well as indirectly individuals and businesses. And these, of course, resonate both the accountability agenda that has been pursued by the Special Rapporteur uh, on Palestine, uh, Professor Link, as well as others, um, and uh, affect a, a whole host of accountability processes we can come back to in the discussion. Um, including the examination by the uh, prosecutor of the ICC, Palestine statehood bid, um, and, and other uh, um, transnational regulatory measures by third states. Um, and of course, the question which remains on the table of whether it is uh, worth uh, or necessary to obtain a further opinion from the International Court of Justice on the applicable law. So in my first Set of remarks, um, let me start with the um, idea or fact that occupation is foremost a, a holding position from the perspective of international law, one that is uh, intended to protect the rights and property of the uh, local population in occupied territory um, and to formally ensure the continuity of such individual and collective rights, prohibiting land swaps, consent for um, give, for wavering, giving up inviolable uh, rights uh, to natural resource exploitation, uh, uh, protection of institutions and laws, and so on. Occupation law ensures that the occupier essentially cannot hide behind, for instance, the absolution of its responsibility or the transfer of its responsibility to local authorities, such as is the case in, uh, in the, the, the Oslo framework. Um, 
while maintaining foreign domination through remote control, perpetuating indefinitely that uh, kind of, of uh, uh, form of political subjugation um, that uh, uh, essentially erodes uh, the internationally recognized right of the Palestinian people, the non-self-governing people uh, historically um, and, and contemporaneously as a, as a, uh, a people that uh, in fact are linked with a recognized state, the state of Palestine, um, preventing the full exercise of that right. Um, but it is clear that occupation law has uh, significant limits um, and that's uh, uh, particularly in relation to um, its ability to prescribe the end of military occupation when an occupying power must either uh, transfer uh, control to local authorities as part of a phase out or uh, indeed when it must withdraw uh, from the foreign territory, uh, particularly due to concerns um, over uh, uh, its claims to sovereign title over that territory, for instance, through annexation, be it de jure or de facto. Um, the, uh, uh, fa the, 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 the fact is, and, and the significance of ensuring that um, applicable international laws beyond um, international humanitarian and human rights law um, are enforced in such cases of occupation tantamount or uh, in, 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 entailing annexation, for instance, um, is necessary essentially to enforce the temporariness, non-transformative and non-revisionist nature of occupation um, and to bring such situations effect effectively to an end in line with um, international law and conflict resolution and prevention, uh, including uh, cardinal peremptory norms uh, prohibiting the use of force to acquire territory and prohibiting the um, erosion of, again, internationally recognized uh, self-determination uh, claims such as those of the Palestinian people. Briefly, um, to be elaborated in the discussion, um, the consequences of this broader framing of the laws applicable to occupations that entail annexation or an underlying claim to sovereignty um, is uh, uh, the fact that um, third states become uh, implicated uh, or can become implicated uh, in maintaining such unlawful situations. And these are unlawful situations are essentially defined in a special set of rules in uh, customary international law on the responsibility of third states. Um, uh, rules that define uh, situations arising from serious breaches of peremptory norms, that is uh, prohibitions such as those on aggression, um, denial of, of self-determination, violations of core international humanitarian law rules, such uh, violations create unlawful situations that um, trigger the responsibilities of third parties, states, international and international organizations in particular, but that have in this context for over a decade um, resulted in measures, non-discretionary countermeasures, in fact, um, that have been taken by, by the EU and its member states, for instance, among other states, by the Human Rights Council um, in its own right in relation to uh, particularly business activities in the illicit economy um, uh, uh, pre that, that, uh, uh, that exists in uh, this unlawful uh, situation maintained by occupation, uh, by Israel's occupation, Palestinian territory, um, and indeed also by the Security Council affirming the uh, need to continue distinguishing between Israel and the territory it occupies, uh, but which it treats as its own. I will leave it here and of course I'm happy to elaborate uh, on, on much of this in the discussion. Thank you. Um, allow me a, a very quick question then. Uh, if we were to kind of broaden the horizon a bit and look beyond this specific case, to what extent is the laws of occupation being applied elsewhere? How many other cases do we have internationally speaking 
and to what extent are the limits of what the law says and does tested elsewhere as well. Right, so both, in fact, both the, fr the broader framing of what law is applicable to situations of occupation, particularly to situations of occupation that entail annexation, for instance, of which there are about uh, half a dozen, I think the count can be <laughs> about eight, about seven, depending on the occupied territory or, or the occupying state, uh, there's a useful database, there, there's, there's no one place where all occupations uh, can be searched up, <laughs> uh, but there is a useful database to that effect by the Geneva, maintained by the Geneva Academy uh, for International Humanitarian Law called Rule of Law and Armed Conflict, um, where uh, 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 there is no, however, account <laughs> of the enforcement of certain rules, but um, in reviewing such rules also in the context of a pro an ongoing project supported by the Institute, which um, all of us are involved in looking at um, the, the international law applicable to such uh, situations of occupation beyond the Israel-Palestine context, it is clear that uh, both the um, focus on the prohibitions on the use of force to acquire territory and issues of self-determination law in such case, cases is uh, backgrounded, obscured, or um, let's say at the very least less prominent than the focus on international humanitarian and human rights law as conflict management rules or, or, or standards. And it's also clear that third parties, states, international organizations, but also businesses insofar as they're affected by the legal risks arising from such business environments are not fully uh, versed in uh, the ways in which they may uh, um, avert such risks and indeed uphold their international responsibility to respond to uh, such unlawful situations by ensuring non-assistance, non-recognition, and, and, and cooperating to bring them to an end. Okay, thank you. I think we'll, we'll, we'll be coming back to that. Uh, we'll circle back to that uh, later on in the conversation. Um, Ralph, would you like to chip in? We can't hear you. There. Yes. Panel. Um, on the Israel-Palestine situation in international law, uh, with the complete absence of Israeli and Palestinian international lawyers, and I've been told this is deliberate, but I should acknowledge this absence and point out to those uh, watching, listening, uh, that in Israeli and Palestinian international lawyers exist and not surprisingly, do have views on what we're discussing today. So I would encourage you all to, uh, who are watching to seek out and read their work. Um, Orna Ben Naftalin, Eyal Ben Benisti, Nora Erekat, Adi Imses, Victor Katan, Michael Svard would be but a few of the examples that could be given here. <clears throat> now, it's common for international law to be invoked as a tool that can be used to dismantle the master's house of Palestinian oppression, to borrow the term used by Audre Lord, specifically the international law on the use of force, including when this interfaces with the law on title to territory and the law of armed conflict, uh, IHL, including, as has been mentioned, occupation law and international human rights law, including the right of self-determination. <clears throat> Related to this common association of international law with emancipatory objectives is the idea that if only the law is enforced, this would bring about emancipation. Or in the negative, that the reason there has not been Palestine, Palestinian liberation is that the law has been violated and there's been no sanction. But the international legal system with its origins in imperialism and colonialism and its operation through and the assumption of the legitimacy of the division of the world into sovereign states, often based on imperial and colonial boundaries, and we just had the explanation of, of that in this context, is embedded with the ideology and techniques of colonialism. So it has to be asked, is this not another master's house? Would the implementation of international law necessarily bring about Palestinian liberation? <clears throat> 
more fundamentally, is law of its nature a conservative social institution cap uh, compatible with transformatory emancipation? Now, in a forthcoming article in the Palestine Yearbook of International Law, I seek to provide a critical evaluation of what is at stake when these areas of international law are invoked in the context of the Palestinian struggle. Are these tools up to the job? And today, just briefly, I'd like to very briefly sketch out my argument. So there's a predominant and sometimes even exclusive focus on international humanitarian law, including occupation law, when the Palestinian struggle is addressed by international advocates as a matter of international law. Relatedly, there is uh, sometimes an exclusive focus on the occupation itself. At a stroke, this focus excludes key elements of the Palestinian struggle arising out of the creation of Israel in 1948, such as the question of the position of Palestinians vis-a-vis -vis the territory of Israel, whether in terms of Israeli citizens or Palestinians who were displaced from that territory in the Nakba in the run-up to and in the period after Israel's creation. Moreover, even within the limited focus on the occupation, the exclusive inv invocation of occupation law in ignores entirely, because of the narrow scope of this law, the question of the existential legitimacy of the occupation itself. Occupation law is concerned with making occupations more humane. It's not about bringing them to an end. There are two areas of international law that do address the existential leg legitimacy of the occupation, the law on the use of force and the law of self-determination, which also interface with the law on title to territory with important implications for annexation. On annexation, whereas international law provides a seemingly clear repudiation of the legitimacy of this as far as Israeli efforts in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, are concerned, this area of law doesn't in and of itself necessarily delegitimize the continuation of the occupation. It simply prevents Israel from founding a claim to sovereignty on the occupation. In other words, de facto annexation can occur. As far as the law on the use of force more generally is concerned, although this does provide a basis for challenging the continued occupation of the occupation, the way it's commonly understood requires Palestinians to frame their arguments in terms of Israel, Israel's security needs only. The arguments needing to be that these security needs don't necessitate the occupation, that it's disproportionate and unnecessary, and not also their own demands for freedom. As far as the law of self-determination is concerned, whereas this right provides an alternative basis for framing arguments which is ostensibly oriented towards freedom for the Palestinian people, it's commonly presented as limited to an approach which requires Palestinian people to accept the model of sovereign statehood as the basis for their collective identity. And within this, to accept uh, this statehood on the basis of the territory of the West Bank and Gaza thereby excluding, like the earlier limited focus on the occupation, the position of Palestinians and the rest of the land between the river and the sea. Moreover, even within the exclusive focus on the West Bank and Gaza as the basis for Palestinian self-determination, this right in international law is often ignored, downplayed, and qualified when Palestine is addressed, notably by human rights NGOs. So, for example, when it comes to international human rights law, where a self-determination is included as a human right in common Article 1 of the two global human rights covenants, there's often negligible treatment of this right when it comes to the activity of international human rights mechanisms and NGOs, such as Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, and the resultant jurisprudence of international human rights law. In consequence, Bodies that use international human rights law as their primary or exclusive frame of reference tend to ignore the one area of this law that would actually speak to the existential legitimacy of the occupation. In consequence, they tend not to address that topic. In this way, then, the tools of human rights law, 
are concerned with making conditions for life as part of the master's house better, not dismantling the house, the conditions of oppression itself. Now, the common critique that's made of international law, including in this context, is that it may be all well and good, but it's not enforced because of power imbalances and politics. What I'm trying to suggest is the importance of appreciating how sometimes these imbalances and political preferences are evident in and enabled by the law. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, let me give you a, a question response. I mean, this is obviously something that always is there. And as a non-lawyer, uh, maybe I'm treading on toes now, but but I'm sure you are aware of the fact that, that law by itself does not apply anywhere. It only applies in conjunction with some kind of institutionalized power in order to be enforced, whether we're talking about traffic laws in, in Stockholm or, or even more complicated if we're talking about international law because we're dealing with sovereign states. So my, my question, if you will, would be um, with the risk again of sounding utterly real politic, but can there be, and this is perhaps somewhat philosophical, but can there be a law of occupation that basically just tries to outlaw a condition uh, which is in a sense inherent in a world where sovereign states uh, wage war on each other and occupy each other's territory. I mean, can law of occupation be much more than a way of trying to humanize a condition which the law in and of itself cannot eradicate? So, or would you like to suggest that it can? We're losing you. Now. Yes. No. No, as in. Ralph? You can't hear me. Now, now we can. Now we can. You can now? Yes. Okay, I can't hear you, but if you can hear me, that. Uh, <laughs> um, now I'm struggling to remember the question. So um, the point that I'm trying to make is indeed occupation law doesn't it is not itself concerned with that existential question, and is 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 uh, in its own terms only limited to the question of how occupations are conducted and whether they meet certain standards concerning, in to a certain degree. Um, uh, humane standards in inverted commas. The law on the international law on the use of force and also the international law of self determination does supposedly address that existential question. And so, if your question is whether international law could be conceived to be concerned with such matters, the legitimacy of war and occupation in and of itself, then yes, that's what international law purports to do. Yes, I now, understand Whether that. you think that possible to have a notion of a rule of law in international relations that can somehow address such matters, given that they cut against the, the, the actions of powerful states, that is indeed a very good question. That's a question that's generic to the idea of international law itself. Okay, we'll be circling back to that one as well, I think. Catriona, you've been waiting patiently, please. Very patiently and enjoying the presentations. I was speaking to a colleague today and I said, I was speaking in, in Sweden at a seminar today and she said, lucky you, I've never been to Sweden and here I am in North London. So greetings from North London. I have also never been to Sweden. Uh, thank you to the organizers, thanks to the co-panelists. So actually I think I'm building on all three of you and, and maybe particularly on, 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 on Ralph's uh, mention of the emancipatory claims of self-determination. Uh, so I think all of us have an idea about self-determination as being romantic, emancipatory as Ralph suggests, a project of liberation. Uh, and I'm here to, to rain on that parade a little bit and talk about a counter practice 
And we can talk a bit about why I call it a counter practice. Maybe some of you would say, well, it's just a violation. So that's something for the discussion. But I'm going to call it a counter practice of self determination that we see in the Israel Palestine peace process and around it, but not only, we see it elsewhere as well. Okay, so I've identified three counter practices to this romantic or emancipatory version of self determination here in North London. I'll keep mentioning North London. Uh, okay, so the first one is what I would call earned sovereignty counter practice. So I'm going in each of these, I'll give you what the claim is. I'm aware we've only got five minutes. Uh, I'll give you what the claim is, and then I'll give you the counter claim. Okay, so the claim of self determination is that it's an immediate and unconditional right of a people uh, to exercise a free choice over its territorial political destiny. Uh, and we could cite much authority for that, including the colonial declaration of 1960. Okay, so I'll give you some peace process counter practice here. So I, I'm just picking out two examples, but one is that we have in a peace process, rather than having a sort of free and unconditional right, we have a protracted negotiation between unequal parties. So that's a slight counter practice. Uh, and the other uh, is something called earned sovereignty, uh, which is a practice of making the right of self-determination, instead of being immediate or unconditional, dependent on conditionals and incremental and moving in stages. And of course, that's something we see with Oslo and particularly with the roadmap for peace. Okay, so that's my first counter practice is earned sovereignty uh, versus some conditional immediate self-determination. Uh, my second counter practice, I'm gonna call ethnic self-determination counter practice. So again, the dominant claim, the dominant claim in the law of self-determination is that self-determination sort of had a sort of progress move through the 20th century. It started up being a sort of ethnic idea, and then it moved at the moment when it became a legal right to a territorial idea. So right, the people inside a territory uh, in some way. Uh, and what I want to suggest is in fact, we have an, an ethnic counter practice in peace process uh, discourse, where we see self-determination called up in the service of very ethnic visions of statehood. Uh, and I'll just give you an example. Um, this is from Livni uh, speaking to the Palestinians during the negotiations at Annapolis in, in 2007. Uh, and, and I'll quote her here. She says, our ideas refer to two states for two peoples or two nation states, Palestine and Israel living side by side in peace and security with each state constituting the homeland of its people, their national, self uh, national aspirations and self-determination in their own territory. Israel, the state of the Jewish people, and I would like to emphasize the meaning of its people is the Jewish people and Palestine for the Palestine, Palestinian people. And I think we see this persistence of an ethnic idea of statehood and of self-determination in the demand that we have recognition of Israel, not only as a state, but as a Jewish state. Um, okay, my third counter practice, and this follows on this idea that we actually have a persistence of an ethnic vision of self-determination and not just a territorial vision, um, is what I'm calling a legitimization of, or legitimation of population transfer counter practice. Okay, so in standard self-determination discourse, we would find two claims that relate to transfer, um, both of which have been alluded to by the previous speakers, especially Paul talking about the right of return. So the first claim in self-determination is that moving settlers into a self-determination unit or occupied territory uh, violates the right of self-determination. And it does so because it violates the process of self-determination. It might upset the demographic balance. We see this in Western Sahara, if you're one day trying to organize a referendum or because it violates the substance of self-determination resources, territory. Again, we see this with the settlements in the West Bank. So that's one claim. Settler implantation is unlawful. Another claim that is made by the dominant discourse on the emancipatory discourse and self-determination is that it furnishes a right to return. If a people have a right to self-determination, then refugees from that people have got the right to return. And, and Paul talked really eloquently about this. Uh, so, okay, so I just want to finish by saying, uh, identifying two counter practices in the peace process to these dominant emancipatory claims of self-determination. The first is, I think, in the peace process, and this has been alluded to by Lisa Valentina and Paul talking about land swaps, is that I think what we have in the peace process discourse, and I don't just mean in, by the Israelis, I mean in the, in the 
wider peace process discourse is a legitimation of settler implantation. And I think it works two ways, one of which picks up on what Ralph was talking about. The first is that we have a human rights discourse that say, look, settlers are human beings, they have human rights. To carry out a reverse population transfer of settlers would somehow be contrary to their human rights. And we have some practice in this in the European Court of Human Rights in the Demopolis case in relation to Turkish settlers in, in Cyprus, and I'm happy to talk about that. And then I think what happens is this ethnic vision of self-determination comes in. It says, well, hang on, if we're, if we're not reversing the settler implantation, if the settlers are staying, they can't stay in the Palestinian state, they have to stay in the Israeli state. And therefore the settlers remaining become a vehicle for claims about annexation of settlements to Israel. And this I think is what we see in the land swap idea it's an ethnic vision of self-determination, partly fueled by human rights discourse about not reversing transfer. Okay, so my first counter practice uh, for this final point is legitimization of unlawful settler implantation. And then the final one is that, in fact, the ethnic vision of self-determination ends up denying the right of return for the Palestinian refugees. In other words, it follows that if Palestine is for the Palestinian people and Israel is for the Jewish people, uh, as we have the claim, then the Palestinian refugees should return not to their homes in what today is Israel, but rather to the West Bank, the national home. Um, in other words, resettlement is framed as a return. Okay, so those are my three counter practices, uh, earned sovereignty, uh, ethnicity, and legitimization of population transfer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Does anyone else want to chip in on that point? Otherwise, I'd like to kind of uh, have, have you elaborate on some of the things that you already mentioned. Um, and there's also uh, questions from the audience on, on these things. So why don't we begin with something that might, and I stress the word might, look somewhat less complicated compared to some of the other issues here. And that is on residency in Jerusalem. As you mentioned, Paul, uh, Jerusalem being a, at least having a dimension of being a separate issue uh, in the sense of access. Um, what is the legal status of Jerusalem and the people who live there? Who wants to pick up on that? Paul? Unmute yourself. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I read the, the question. Um, so uh, let me see now. Okay. Well, uh, first of all, it's it's different in Western and, and Eastern Jerusalem. So I think in West, West Jerusalem, uh, from an Israeli law point of view, uh, there's no a definite uh, distinction. Obviously, ethnicity plays a role even here, but 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 they are citizens. As for East Jerusalem, I think it's correct, and other panelists can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's correct as the question assumes that uh, uh, Palestinians living in East Jerusalem, which is occupied, have, have residency status, but they do not have citizen status. I think they can apply for citizenship if they so wish, but it's, it's very uncommon. But anyway, the, uh, the interesting question here is that um, Palestinian Jer Jerusalemites can lose their residency status if they breach allegiance to Israel. Uh, the questioner uh, points out, and then he or she uh, adds, but according to Article 45 of the Hague Conventions, and I'm sure it's the fourth Hague Convention, Palestinians don't have to be loyal to the occupying power. And of course, this is, <laughs> this is correct. Um, uh, you cannot, as an occupying power, ask for loyalty from the occupied population, um, which is not so difficult to understand if you think of it. But um, uh, the problem here is, of course, that Israel considers East Jerusalem as a part of Israel proper. So they think that people who live within Israel proper should have at least some form of, of loyalty to to the state of Israel. So here we have a sort of a, a mismatch between the international law point of view, which sees East Jerusalem as 
occupied territory, not part of Israel, and Israel, the point of view which sees East Jerusalem as an integral part of, of Israel. But of course, um, under the view of almost all countries, uh, the Hague Convention, the law of occupation does apply. So uh, one should not be, um, uh, one cannot lose residency status because one is not loyal to the occupier. Very good. Anyone else who wants to pick up on that? Um, let me then uh, just to, to let's build on that for a moment. Uh, there's another question coming in which also deals with this. Uh, and this is, of course, what are you allowed to do when you are occupied? As in not just in terms of, of let's say, how much do you have to, to adhere to orders and regulations of the occupier, but what are you allowed to do in terms of resistance? This is a classic issue which we see in many states that went from being colonized to becoming post-colonial. Uh, and theoretically speaking then, what is the legal ramifications in this particular case? So oh, I could yes. ask if my mic is still on. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So well, the brief answer is that the, under the law, of, the law of occupation, the law, occupier has a right to demand um, compliance by the occupied population. Now, um, conversely, the occupied population or the, the members of the occupied population do not have an obligation under international law to comply with with what the occupying power says. It's just an authority given to the occupying power because an occupying power has the right to uphold security and order in the occupied territory. They cannot introduce their own population, you know, um, change the status of the territory, etc. but they have uh, the right to uphold order. So they can demand that, including through penal sanctions. But it's uh, for sure not a violation of international law to resist occupation. Very good. Um, yes, Ralph. No. Try. That working now? Yes. So I, I think it's important also to, to, to acknowledge that um, uh, the very existential legitimacy of the occupation itself um, uh, also has to be considered. And um, it isn't all, what we've heard about so far from, far from Paul presupposes the occupation being in operation and then certain um, entitlements that the occupying authority has to maintain order. That doesn't mean that the maintenance of the occupation itself is thereby legitimated. That's a separate question. I'm not suggesting Paul was, was saying that, but that's then a separate question, which is about the law on the use of force, which determines whether or not the occupation should even be in operation to begin with, uh, including for considerations of uh, security and that's a separate question and, and, and the two need to be uh, both taken into account. This is, I think, one of the problems with the, with the focus only on occupation law um, and not also these more fundamental questions um, which require the occupation to end. Okay, um, very good. So why don't we pursue that for a moment? Let me ask you in this vein then, and let's see who wants to, to help me understand this and help the audience understand this. There is law. There are also a number of UN Security Council resolutions on this particular issue. So what is the relationship between them in this particular case? And the fact that some of the UN Security Council resolutions are trying to mediate the conflict rather than determine directly what is legal and not legal, right? Because we are then moving inexorably towards what is politically decided rather than what is legally determined. 
Okay, ground first and then pull. Okay, pull first. Anyone? Okay, thank you. Well, um, I feel that I feel that I speak too much, but since since you addressed the Security Council, I, I couldn't resist. <laughs> so the Security Council is a is a law, and well, it's an it's a police power. It does not it is not a court of law. It cannot settle disputes. So the council does that now and then anyway, when it feels that it's necessary to say something about, about borders and so forth uh, in order to maintain or uphold or uh, restore peace and security. But it's not basically within its mandate, but it can uh, devise or it, it can direct the parties to means to settle their disputes. Now, I think that uh, the distinction between, on the one hand, the law of occupation and human rights, which sort of deals with the day-to-day -day, uh, affairs of the, of the occupation, on the one hand, and the more basic uh, law on the use of force, including the right or not to acquire territory by force, and the, the law of self-determination is an important and difficult one. And I think it's very important that Ralph um, pointed, that, pointed that out. And I... I uh, and I think that 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 the point that he's that you're trying to make Ralph in the in your draft article is a very interesting one. So uh, whether the law of occupation is uh, respected or not does not change whether the occupation as such is legal or not. Those are two different things. But I think that there is a, a link though, and I think that came out directly in in Valentina's presentation because. Uh, I think it's in particular clear in, in the present situation in the, in the West Bank, where we have a creeping expropriation or de facto expropriation, where the Israel is not only expropriating, I'm sorry, annexing, annexing the East Jerusalem, but is also establishing facts on the ground, which uh, would make uh, withdrawal very difficult and which also sort of gives Israel uh, a lot of the benefits which one would normally have only after a formal annexation. So from that point of view, efforts to uphold the law of occupation, for instance, the, the prohibition from introducing settlers, efforts to uphold the law of occupation actually does have implications also for the right of self-determination and for the prohibition of acquisition of territory through the use of force. Thanks. Ralph? No. Now? Yes. I just wanted to add about the, the, the Security Council. I mean, the, the uh, of course, we have to remember, now I'm, I'm switching to kind of black letter uh, lawyer uh, speak, uh, that the, the the council does not have the competence under the UN Charter to um, it, it introduce um, through its Chapter Seven uh, competence um, uh, an arrangement that would somehow be legally operative if that involved a violation of the self determination of the Palestinians. Um, so there are limits to um, to the council's competence, uh, both as a matter of internal UN law. Uh, the law of the United Nations, and also then in terms of the consequences that any such determination would have uh, for other states and their obligations in international law as far as self-determination is concerned. Thank you. Valentina? <clears throat> Circling back, I guess, to the point I, I made very briefly at the end about the Security Council being an international uh, a, a, a UN body is as such an international organization bound by customary international law on state on 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 res on uh, uh, responsibility rules and the uh, responsibility of international organizations for internationally wrongful acts, uh, which is a body of customary international law similar to that of state responsibility. So in that sense, the Security Council is also obligated to uh, ensure um, 
the UN's uh, non-assistance uh, and non-recognition is lawful of certain unlawful acts, namely, uh, as, as I've discussed, the, the elements of the situation of occupation, be it rights, titles, benefits obtained by third parties uh, from uh, the, the ongoing um, Israeli occupation, Palestinian territory, but many other occupations by, by that same measure. And that's, I suppose, a unique, um, lesser known uh, set of, of countermeasures, non-discretionary countermeasures, that put both uh, the Security Council and many other international organizations, as well as uh, foremost third states in the position of resisting a certain significant form of illegality understood as, as serious breaches of peremptory norms. But really here, um, put in lay terms, we are talking about the underlying processes of structural violence that produce violations of international humanitarian and human rights law. So uh, th there is a question, I think, I suppose, as Paul mentioned, of whether uh, a certain uh, threshold of violations of humanitarian or human rights law as such uh, constitute a violative occupation. Uh, but that is, um, I think, necessarily the case when the fundamental uh, um, underlying uh, norms on the use of force and on self-determination are being breached by an occupying power, which is of course the case. And I think just to layer onto that at a final point, um, we are uh, both in, in the case of Israel's occupation of Palestinian and Syrian territory, but also in the case of um, a, a, a host of other situations of occupation that, that have an underlying claim to sovereignty, uh, we are uh, uh, essentially um, in a situation where the occupying state does not recognize itself as an occupying state. I think this dissonance, cognitive dissonance, is, is very important. It's not unique to Israel, who from the very early days of the occupation, if not before that occupation began already, I had the view that the Geneva Conventions are not formally applicable and that it is not bound by occupation law and that in fact this is a dispute uh, over uh, territory. And I think though that framing that is imposed on the situation from the perspective of international is, is protective as such as discussed but also has very significant implications for the types of actions required by third parties including international organizations to resist the legality. Very good. Um, I want to come back to something that I think uh, also Catriona addressed. But before we do that, um, since you mentioned third parties, um, let's take this then one step further into the world of uh, pragmatic uh, policy, if you will. Uh, the EU position, and to what extent does the EU, in a sense, follow its own principles of maintaining legality in its practical uh, reactions and behavior vis-a-vis -vis the occupation, as in to what extent does it acknowledge that it is an occupation, not just in a legal sense, but in a practical sense, and does that then have any actual impact on how the EU relates to the issue? Sure, very, very briefly to that, because there's, there's quite a bit to say on that, but the EU's positions are in fact reflective of the uh, occupation law plus <laughs> framing, the broader framing, which includes uh, reference to force and self-determination as discussed, uh, because the, the, the clear basic position for, for, for very long to over a decade, uh, if not more, that the EU and member states respectively most uh, have maintained explicitly is one of non-recognition of Israel's sovereignty over the occupied territory. That means very much uh, implicitly that um, the EU is aware of Israeli domestic practice, which really claims um, and, and treats the territory uh, as, as part of its sovereign territory. The, um, however, implementation of that position uh, has not been uh, historically as uh, the, the 
80s, if not before the European community, um, uh, the, the various uh, 60 plus areas of cooperation between Israel and the EU and many, many more bilateral uh, instruments uh, and ad hoc uh, relations between Israel and member states. Those do not always, um, cons are not always consistently implemented uh, in line with the with the um, position on non recognition of sovereignty, and it was only um, as of um, 2012, roughly, if not slightly before, that the EU was made aware um, of the oversights in the way certain uh, relations, be it on trade, uh, civil aviation, research and development. Uh, and so on, many areas of ongoing, um, uh, uh, many areas of relations that are, are subject to ongoing revision as we speak due to the fact that the EU um, and its uh, member state authorities uh, have been implementing those instruments of cooperation in a way that recognizes as lawful the most illegal Israeli acts uh, uh, in, in uh, Palestinian territory. And the correction processes themselves are a reflection, of course, of the, of the value of um, activating the role of third parties in uh, potential enforcement uh, process uh, of the sort that seeks to maintain the cooperation relations so as not to sever them. There is no such obligation until indeed the uh, inability of the third party to ensure non-recognition is proven and, and, and the wrongdoing actors or, or states in this case, um, unwillingness to, to conform to that, to the third party's position on, on the on the relevant issue, which in this case, uh, for one primarily, but not exclusively, has to do with the definition of, of Israel's um, domestic uh, jurisdiction. Okay. Um, if no one else wants to chip in on that, then why don't we go to the hottest potato uh, for the moment before we, we come back to what I want to hopefully get more on, which is sovereignty. But before we get there, um, uh, President Donald Trump as you know, uh, has a plan uh, for some kind of uh, solution for uh, this whole conflict, supposedly. Uh, this peace deal uh, that the Trump administration has been uh, trying to, to uh, bring to the table uh, and sell, uh, what would be your very brief off-the-cuff um, grading of it from an international law perspective. Who wants to go first? Catriona. Now. Can you hear me now? Yes. So, so I got my, I, and I'm actually asking my students to do exactly that. That's going to be their exercise. They have to grade the Trump plan with marks for international legal analysis and uh, it's, it's going to be the assignment. Uh, so I, I don't think he's going to get very high marks um, from anyone. Uh, and I think all of us can find something in there in particular that speaks to our particular projects. Uh, but for me, one of the things that, that stands out is this ongoing legitimation of, of transfer. So in the name of avoiding population transfer, that's his claim. His claim is he wants to stop no more transfers, you know, no Arab, no Jew, nobody should be moved. But on that basis, the clock stops and the settlements get to stay and the refugees don't come home. So it's, so in the name of avoiding population transfer, he in fact legitimates two big population transfers, one into uh, the West Bank and, and the other, the non-return of the refugees. Uh, so that would be the sort of thing I might pick up on. Also this ethnic vision of self-determination where it's Israel is for the Jews and the Palestinian state is for the Arabs, it's for the Palestinians and they should go there. That vision is through. So it's a very ethnic vision of trans of um, self-determination and it commits to being against transfer, but in fact legitimates transfer. Okay, thank you. Who wants to 
help us grade? I'd give it a third in UK terms. And fail. Paul? Well, I would certainly give it a fail. Uh, <clears throat> well, uh, to add to that, I think that's, that there's also a clear element in that peace plan of earned sovereignty, which Kajon also referred to, and I think Ralph referred to this in his um, draft article, namely that uh, Palestinians will get a state under certain conditions which they have to be, which have to be fulfilled. Um, and of course, that is um, uh, those condi conditions ha have to do with Israeli Israeli security. So, uh, and uh, the the right to self determination, as uh, as conceived now, has no such element. If there is a people that have the right to determine themselves, now obviously the concept of statehood is a very problematic one. Um, so it, the state is, is a very, uh, so uh, it's not a self-evident way for people to organize themselves, but you know, if there, every, anyone who wants to exercise self-determination in the modern society has, has to do it within that mold, so to speak. Um, but statehood as such doesn't resolve all difficult issues, even if you accept that problematic form in itself. So for instance, you st still need to determine things like um, who are the people? Uh, should, is it based on a territory, which I think is the more modern variant, or which is still sometimes the case, is it based on a people from some form of ethnic or, or other that already existing people is. So uh, an exist, a people that uh, is deemed to exist in some form even before the state is created. Thanks. Thank you. Valentina? Um, I, I do hope it is, uh, re the question uh, is relegated to, to uh, an academic exercise of the past, perhaps. Um, it's relevant to, appropriate to this day that we're um, presenting on. But I, I suppose maybe I could just quickly add that the, the unfortunate um, uh, mold that Paul spoke to, the fact that sovereignty and, and requirements uh, and 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 um, understandings of of statehood, um, uh, that that unfortunate mold, in fact, extends also lamentably to to the ambitions of Palestinian statehood, which which perhaps are uh, worth uh, uh, mentioning uh, are, are 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 quite in the sense that over um, 130. Um, States have recognized Palestine explicitly, explicitly as a state, and 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 scores more of, of states and international organizations treat it as such. Um, so that that is uh, an incontrovertible. However, the question, of course, is what what is missing from that frame? Be it the um, competencies or representative uh, um, um, uh, authority or 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 a scope of the PLO um, and its capacity to remain uh, um, non-territorially um, based or, or linked representative body for, for all uh, Palestinians um, that, that are either from the state of Palestine or indeed from now the state of Israel um, and so forth. So I think, I think the, the, the um, the problematic, perhaps, of, of sovereignty and statehood goes both ways, and it's, uh, for, technically speaking, um, maybe I leave to 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 Katrina to to um, opine whether self determination really offers um, a, a different platform that's a bit significantly more participatory and 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 veridical to the the, the various links um, that that different peoples have uh, with the broader territory of historic Palestine and 
um, which uh, can um, be part of two states perhaps, but, uh, but may not necessarily be. Thank you, Ralph, would you like to add something? Just can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, you can. No. Yeah. Just to just to really uh, tag on to what Valentina said, uh, which is uh, the importance then of, of incorporating a consideration of self determination into the work of um, human rights NGOs who 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 otherwise are are concerned with international human rights law. Uh, but tend to ignore um, this, the, the most important uh, of those rights, uh, when it is in fact, um, uh, arguably, uh, the, um, the issue uh, that has to be factored into these discussions of, of questions like the, um, uh, the, the merit of the, uh, of, of the Trump plan or any other plan that's, that's put forward. The idea being, of course, that um, uh, any settlement has to be based on, on rights and and justice, not simply that it is a settlement in and of itself. Okay, um, I'd like to kind of uh, dig into this sovereignty aspect. Uh, I know, Katriona, you you addressed this to some degree, and uh, the discussion that you had just now. I mean, obviously, I mean. Uh, the whole idea of self-determination is also dependent on your definition of people. And this is something that we've been tinkering with since end of World War I, uh, trying to figure out what would be the most logical and stable uh, formations of territory and identity, uh, whether it's a people or whether it's just a territory that determines it or not. And this has been something that we then played with again, we as in the world, or, or at least those who were in power after World War II, but what about the idea of shared sovereignty? I know it's been uh, uh, suggested off and on as an idea of trying to get away from mutually exclusive uh, combinations of sovereignty and territory, as in a one state solution or some other combination where you share sovereignty, overlapping sovereignty, a bit like the system that was uh, used in the Ottoman Empire uh, in which you could have several legal sovereignties in the same uh, physical territory. So the territory and the sovereignty were not connected in a way that made them mutually exclusive to other legal entities. Uh, so briefly, I mean, in the sense that you could have Greek Orthodox applying law to Greek Orthodox living in the same territory as Muslims who then were sub subject to Muslim law, etc. So the idea that sovereignty and territory are not connected in the way that the whole state system in the rest of the world now is applied, would that be one potential way of getting out of the conundrum of, of how to disentangle, rather, rather than to disentangle, in a sense, a mesh or, or integrate? Katronia, would you like to, to pick up on this challenge? Now. Yeah, so I, I, I'll come at it through a self-determination lens. And, and, and one argument, I guess, would be that self-determination isn't, although it has a substantive element to it, it isn't about an outcome, it's more about the process. And, and the sort of cardinal principle would be that you're somehow protecting the free choice of the people. And that therefore can lead to all sorts of creative and imaginary, you know, new imaginary ways of thinking about the outcome, right? So if you took a very process way, on the other hand, we have to worry a little bit about process when we've got unequal partners and, and then we want to protect the substance of the self-determination right. And we see that in the Chagos uh, advisory opinion where they give some substance to it. You have to protect it so that somehow peoples who are not fully consenting are giving bits of it away. So subject to the, so I, I suppose my, this is a bit of a cop out, but I just think I'm all in favor of whatever that can be freely agreed by the Palestinian people. And, and that's the sort of essence of self-determination. But I'm wary, for example, when it comes to land swaps, I'm wary of ostensibly negotiated solutions that might uh, legitimize prior illegalities. So 
I, but all in favor of imagine new imaginary ways of doing things, or imaginative. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, Paul. I could say, say something briefly, a bit off the cuff. Uh, I think that uh, we already already have um, well, not not shared sovereignty, but sort of shared governance in the Oslo under the Oslo agreements with the A, B, and C uh, territories. So, and it's well, I mean, <laughs> it's working on a day-to-day -day basis, but not to the um, satisfaction of of everyone. So, uh, but it has been tried in other places, but. I th I think, as Katrina says, everything that can be agreed, anything that can be agreed between the parties is acceptable. But I think it is it is difficult, though, and in particular in in a modern society for a number of reasons. One of them is that um, since everything is is connected now globally, so you would. Um, uh, and everything is connected also. So, Subject-wise, that, that is, you know, um, telecommunications affect the financial streams um, you know, and af affect culture and so forth. So it's it's very difficult to, you know, when sort of different considerations conflict, who is going to, who will be the final arbiter in a certain time and place if sovereignty is divided between different. Authority. So I think that will be one aspect. Another aspect is that, um, well, can you then guarantee the uh, human rights of everyone if they're under, you know, if if that's a split sovereignty? Because I'm I'm sure that one sort of authority would then be you know, culturally or religiously uh, based, and um, so that sort of invites such questions. As well, so how how far would that autonomy or that part of the shared sovereignty go? Thank you. So, but again, it's it's a very interesting, but also I think very difficult idea. Ralph, no, no. Is it working now? Sorry about this. Yes. Okay, so in a former life, I, I wrote a lot about um, internationalization and um, the the idea indeed of um, uh, using uh, throughout the 20th century, uh, there have been various uh, attempts to try to use forms of territorial administration and sovereignty that are uh, something other than the the standard norm of, of of a state being sovereign over its own territory exclusively and that indeed uh, um, arrangements of shared sovereignty and disaggregating uh, which which paul mentioned in the context of oslo in the in the west bank the idea of disaggregating uh, the issue of administration from the issue of sovereignty and that it's possible that the two don't necessarily have to correspond uh, in terms of how things are arranged, right? So th there could be a condominium in terms of sovereignty, in terms of legal status, for example, in relation to Jerusalem, but then administratively on the ground, things could be uh, um, uh, operating in mutually exclusive uh, ways or in ways that are mutually exclusive in, on some issues and not on others. And that arrangement could operate uh, differently, for example, in terms of the the, um, the uh, old city as compared to other parts of Jerusalem, there are lots of different um, options. Um, of course, internationalization was originally um, conceived um, in, in the 20th century uh, in relation to Jerusalem. But what Paul also raised, which is very important, is the question of who, how then this is guaranteed and uh, uh, these arrangements operate um, and, 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 and what sort of uh, mechanisms uh, exist to ensure um, that things uh, run smoothly. And here it seems likely that if any of the arrangements of this kind were introduced that there'd be some kind of level of international 
uh, supervision, international involvement, probably not by the United Nations, um, uh, given the particular uh, position that organization has, certainly as far as Israel is concerned, but maybe by some sort of sui generis entity that is created that has legitimacy uh, for both Palestinians and for Israelis, rather like the high representative in Bosnia Herzegovina. Uh, but then the, that raises its own questions about how these uh, such arrangements are conceived, uh, what the mandate is, what the powers are, what oversight they have. Typically, these arrangements of international supervision have tended to operate in an unaccountable uh, fashion and in a manner where they have uh, asserted a sort of auto-interpretative function in relation to their own powers. Um, and the Security Council, to go back to the earlier discussion, has sometimes also been involved, itself then asserting a role using Chapter 7 authority uh, to make determinations that essentially vary the competence of such supervisors from what appeared to be agreed would be that competence by the parties. And, and anyone who's sort of interested in what can happen there, look at the high representative in Bosnia and look at how the powers of that entity in Bosnia were transformed through self uh, interpretation and Security Council endorsement going way beyond what the parties to the Dayton Peace Agreement, which of course included Bosnia, the state of Bosnia itself, uh, had uh, envisaged. So it, 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 these arrangements are, um, it's important to think about uh, how they're conceived uh, and try to anticipate and learn from previous instances, uh, the kinds of um, problems that can come up, which are not necessarily foreseen at the time when these arrangements are drafted uh, and adopted usually very quickly, um, as was the case, for example, with the Dayton Peace Agreements. That is a very interesting point, but then again, let me kind of uh, try this from a non-legal perspective, looking at the political context, because obviously, if we're taking the Bosnian example or any other example, uh, basically, we're not dealing necessarily with parties themselves, where the people who are representing the people are necessarily very representative. So the parties who are literally signing something are not necessarily particularly representative of the people in general sense. That they supposedly represent. That's one. Two, they have not necessarily come to the table because they want to sit at the table in the sense that they're not necessarily willing to sign a deal. Uh, they have to some degree been forced there either by exhaustion of their military means, for instance, or financial means, or because they are dependent on other parties who are much stronger, who are basically uh, twisting their arm, forcing them to participate in this process. So, I mean, that in itself also says, indicates, one could argue, that where you start the process is not where you're going to end up because of the lack of representation to begin with and the fact that the power play is not just between the parties, but also the ones who are forcing them to the table to sign whatever it is they're signing. So even if you were to have shared sovereignty, in a sense, you need an arbiter of sovereignty who stands above uh, the parties because they themselves haven't necessarily volunteered to share sovereignty. Did, does that make sense? Let me be very concrete. The Israelis and the Palestinians might not come to the table on their own accord. They might be, I'm just, you know, hypothetically, they might be forced to the table to sign something. And whatever it is that they are then signing, uh, if let's say they were to share sovereignty, they would still need an arbiter of that sovereignty, which could not necessarily, by definition, be themselves. And speaking of sovereignty, the Gaza Strip, we had a question on the Gaza Strip and its actual legal status. Anyone wants to answer that question? Is it as simple as to say that the West Bank and Gaza in one breath are on the same legal status because Israel has a different way of dealing with both of them and declaring them differently? 
Anyone? Paul? You look very worried, so I thought maybe you could. <laughs> yes, I am worried. Uh, <laughs> but not about answering the question, even though it is a difficult one. Well, um, uh, so Gaza is one of several examples of the fact that the law was not written specifically for, <laughs> for the Middle East conflict. So um, what is particular here is, of course, that Israel is virtually controlling Gaza, but there are no boots on the ground. So some people think that it is still occupied. Some people think that it is not occupied. And I think that it's, it's not clear which has the better view. But I, I, I think that, it, that the better view is that it is occupied uh, for the reason that the law of occupation was written for the purpose of pr protecting people who live under the control of a foreign power. And Israel does does uh, uh, more or less control Gaza, even though uh, it is administered by uh, by Hamas administration. It, it is Israel that has the, that has the final say on important issues. So I would say that it it is occupied. But of course, Israel treats it differently from the West Bank. Not only in the sense that the, the West Bank is uh, is formally administered by by Israel, but also it. It also thinks of Gaza as a pol different political entity, which is it sometimes is in armed conflict with. Thank you. Thank you. So we are coming to a close. Um, anyone, let's do a final round. Anyone who wants to add something regarding anything we've discussed or anything we haven't managed to, to bring up that you feel that we should have addressed? No one? Well, Ralph? So, uh, can you hear me? Yes. So, Tree mentioned earned sovereignty, and obviously that, that in, in the context of the idea that somehow, which is, uh, th this has been around for a while, this concern uh, articulated, for example, uh, uh, by R.D. Imsis in his uh, recently in the European Journal of International Law and in a forth his forthcoming uh, monograph, the concern that um, somehow the position is being taken that um, self-determination should only be realized when Palestinians are, are deemed ready for it, uh, and that there's a, somehow a standards that have to be met uh, before that, which of course, so, you know, curiously, are never, never quite attained, which was always the issue with um, the colonial era idea of trusteeship. Uh, of course, this is not a new thing. Um, and uh, what I think we have to, though, remember is that this is a, an idea that can also be grafted onto any um, peace plan arranged uh, regime involving a certain degree of international administration and supervision of parts of Palestine, which which often is discussed, and those uh, the challenges to the legitimacy of such an arrangement on self determination grounds don't go away just because the actor that is playing the role of uh, the tutelage role is an international entity rather than a state. Okay, very good. Thank you. Unless there is anyone else who wants to add something, I'd like to thank all of you for uh, helping me and the audience understand some of the intricacies of the international law perspective on the conflict between Israel and Palestine. Thank you very much. Uh, hope to see you again. Thank you. Goodbye. Let's see now.